All right, so to continue our discussion on electronic structure, let's talk about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a theory of physics that was developed in the 1900s. All of the physics before the 1900s is what we call classical mechanics. Now, the reason why quantum mechanics was developed was because in the 1900s, technology had improved such that we were able to do experiments at smaller levels, at microscopic levels, looking at atoms and subatomic particles. And as it turns out, the results of these experiments could not be explained using the theories developed from classical mechanics. So that's why physicists developed quantum mechanics to explain the results that they observed. Now, it's not to say that classical mechanics is wrong, but simply that classical mechanics can only be applied at macroscopic levels. And if you're looking at microscopic levels, looking at atoms or subatomic particles, you have to apply the theories of quantum mechanics instead. Now, there are three key aspects of quantum mechanics. The first is that many quantities, such as energy, is quantized. And we already saw an example of this before, looking at the Bohr model, where we said that the energies of the different energy levels of an atom are quantized. The other two aspects are wave-particle duality and the uncertainty principle, both of which we'll discuss in this video. So let's go ahead and start with the wave-particle duality. This is a concept that states that light and matter behaves like both waves and particles. Now, this is not very intuitive, and it's best understood by looking at the experiments that demonstrated this. So we'll start first with classical mechanics, which really thought of light as a wave from the experiments that were performed. And we can understand this if we take a look at Young's double slit experiment. So what Young did was he took light and he shined it through a screen with two slits and looked at the results on a viewing screen. And as with all experiments, we can make predictions about the results. So if light were to act as a particle, then you would predict that the light would just pass through the slits and form two bright lines on the viewing screen. However, Young did not observe that. And instead, what he saw was on the viewing screen, there was a pattern of bright and dark bands that were clearly the result of wave diffraction and interference. So essentially, this experiment showed that light exhibits wave behaviors. All right, so now let's look at a quantum mechanics experiment looking at the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is a very interesting phenomenon where if you take metal and you shine light on it, it's possible for you to eject electrons. Those electrons ejected from the light are what are called photoelectrons. Now, it was known that in order to eject an electron, you needed to supply a certain quantity of energy. And that amount of energy to eject an electron was called the work function. Under the wave theory of light, the energy of a light is dependent on its intensity. So the brighter the light, the more energy it has. So we can make a few predictions. So first, if you were to use dim light, you would expect a long delay before any photoelectrons are ejected. And that's because dim light doesn't have enough energy. So when you shine that dim light on the metal, you have to wait a long time before the metal absorbs enough energy in order to eject a photoelectron. Another prediction that you can make is that if you were to use light of higher intensity where it does have enough energy to eject a photoelectron instantaneously, you would expect that if you use even brighter light, that brighter light would have excess energy, and that excess energy would give the ejected photoelectron kinetic energy. So if you were to increase the intensity, your photoelectrons should be ejected with more and more kinetic energy. Now, unfortunately, none of those predictions were true. As they saw in the results of the experiment, there were different results. So first of all, if they used dim light, it turned out that a key player wasn't really the intensity, but more so the frequency. So for instance, if they use red light, 
which has pretty low frequency, it doesn't matter if you use dim light or bright light. No matter what, you wouldn't be able to eject any photoelectrons. However, instead, if you use light of greater frequencies like blue light, blue light would be able to eject electrons instantaneously regardless of the intensity. So that means even if you were to use dim blue light, there was no delay before photoelectrons were ejected. In addition, if you increase the intensity of the blue light, the photoelectrons were not ejected with more kinetic energy. They had the same kinetic energy as with dim light. The only observation that was made when you increase the intensity of the blue light was that more photoelectrons were ejected. Now, as it turns out, the only way that these results could be explained was if light acted as a particle, where each particle of light, which we now call photons, deliver their energy to an electron in the metal. If the energy of that individual photon exceeds the work function, then that electron would be ejected. So we can see that this experiment demonstrates that light exhibits particle behavior. Now, a lot of what we just discussed can actually be explained by the following equation. We have Ke, which stands for the kinetic energy of the ejected photon. This is equal to Hv minus phi. Now, Hv, we will recall this from our previous video, that this is the energy of a photon, which is directly proportional to the frequency V of the photon. And phi, of course, is the work function. So you can see from this equation, if you use light of low frequency, if that energy of the photon is less than the work function, you wouldn't be able to eject any electrons. However, if you increase the intensity at some point, sorry, if you increase the frequency, at some point the energy of the photon will exceed the work function. And if it exceeds the work function, you'd be able to eject a photoelectron with kinetic energy. And the greater the frequency, the greater the kinetic energy of that ejected photoelectron. So put together from these two experiments, we can understand why light exhibits both wave and particle behavior. Okay, so now let's take a look at the uncertainty principle, which is often called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle uh, for the scientist who came up with this theory. This states that it is not possible to simultaneously measure the position and momentum of a particle to exact precision at the same time. So in other words, the more precisely you measure one of these two quantities, position or momentum, the less precise you can measure that other quantity. And this is often reflected in this equation where we have delta x times delta p is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. Now here, delta x is equal to the uncertainty in position. And delta p is equal to the uncertainty in momentum. And h is just Planck's constant, 4 times pi, those are just numbers, so this is just some constant value. And the idea you can see here is it's impossible for your uncertainty and position and momentum to be zero, right? Because based on this equation, the product of your two uncertainties always has to be greater than some positive constant. And furthermore, you can see, if you were to decrease your uncertainty and position, you must have greater uncertainty in your momentum. 